I was born in Kazakhstan. That's one of the USSR republics. Um, and uh, then traveled through the um, activity and job of our father. So he was in service and we were in, based in Prague, Czech Republic, Slovakia back then. And eventually um, 1985 got um, to Ukraine and just a couple of months later, Chernobyl exploded. <laughs> There was, there was, um, there was a, con a coincidence with traveling and just being there, but that actually became also part of um, of my life and life of our family and uh, millions of people in uh, Eastern and Western Europe, because something like Chernobyl or Fukushima, God forbid, anything like that happen again. But uh, we need to learn from it a lot. So, and I and not just uh, the theory of it. Uh, through practical side of it, yeah. And he was in the Soviet Air Force, right? Yes. He was in the Soviet Air Force, and then he was stationed near Chernobyl and had to go and help with the cleanup of the aftermath of Chernobyl. Do you remember? Yeah, he, he, yeah go he ahead. He's one of uh, uh, liquidators, so-called, yeah. Do you remember him talking about it at the time or what that, what that felt like at the time? Do you remember how your mom was, was thinking about it? Uh, back then in the Soviet time, um, it was forbidden to talk about it after the explosion right away. Obviously, um, dad came home and said, you cannot go outside. Just remain home as much as possible and um, close the windows and um, just uh, wash your, if you're out, wash your shoes and don't get in the contact with, with anything outside um, in a certain way. So we knew something happened, so obviously he said it, um, but uh, for days it was, um, it was silence. So, you know, government just wanna hide it. Um, I don't know what was the person, the purpose for that, um, but um, for a certain amount of days in the beginning right after the explosion, was not a topic in the media at all. And then I know your father got sick from it as well. How long did that Unfortunately, take? Unfortunately, passed, passed away from that as well, yeah. How long did it take for him to start developing symptoms? Well, it's um, over the years, um, pretty much him and his bodies uh, that were uh, involved with that uh, were affected and some of them went um, earlier, some others later, but eventually got um, all of them. Uh, I think it depends on the dose, it depends on the um, status of your health. And uh, so all those um, little things in, in the collection eventually make you live longer or shorter after being exposed to the radiation. Who, who was your father? He was, um, he was, um, he was a very positive guy. Um, he had like two sides, you know, uh, because he was in the army, he was very structured, very systematic, disciplined. Um, and when he's like systematic and disciplined, he's, he's uh, very, uh, he was uh, exaggeratingly serious, you know, really, he was like focused on, um, on all of this. And on the on other side, he was, um, he was a bit goofy as well, you know, he was like, he's, he, has, he had a great sense of humor and uh, har army army humor you know <laughs> it's a very special humor, <laughs> army humor that you have in the army and uh, uh, he i'm just happy and glad to have a um, father uh like my brother and i have um because uh, we're actually reflecting him in a certain way you know we, we're all reflecting our parents ecosystem and our environment where we grew up or growing up and we're reflecting our friends as well and our co-workers eventually down down the line um but uh, back to the father um I'm, I'm just lucky to have a father like that to have had a father like that was he a tough guy um 
he didn't really express it as a tough guy you know he he was um he was more more kind of lean back and um but you could feel this this core of strength and um as i said in discipline and uh being tough to himself first not being tough with others not at all uh, well it de- it was like depending like if someone is not following the discipline and not um getting the line it's supposed to be then uh, you know he was getting tougher but he never expressed himself as a tough guy so uh, i knew he was tough super tough um but never never really got to um harm anyone or acting tough or something like that so i know that you you learn boxing from your brother especially you you would spar with him where do you think he learned it from He was born as a fighter. I think genetically, somehow, somewhere, he was always, he was just born this way. From the childhood, I remember it. Like there's like some core um, in him that was like, um, I, I, would say, I would say, if you think about it, just you or anyone that listening to us right now, just think about your parents and who of the both parents you're reflecting more, father or mother? So, and, and it's interesting. And I asked the same question, my brother, I'm like, so what do you think? Like, do you reflect more mom or dad? And he was thinking and he was like, you know, go into himself and like, you know, I think more my dad, you know, our dad. And I say, you're then right about it. <laughs> I can tell. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm reflecting more my mom um, than my dad. Um, even though you know there is mutual love for both of them, um, and I think pro- probably partially he got it genetically from my dad, and he's a true fighter. I've learned how to be a fighter. I was, you know, I was born with different um, capabilities of of agility. Uh, and getting uh, adjusted to certain things, um, and he's more he's more uh, straighter and um, you know fighter, and he's like very um, he's very solid as a he has a very solid foundation of 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 being um, being probably more um, I don't want to say more systematic and disciplined, but probably probably more like as a fighter is just very focused on one thing and nothing can stop him. You've got a good endurance. There is nothing like endurance beats everything, talent and masterpiece. Endurance is in boxing, in the politics, business, whatever life is, endurance is, is a crucially important uh, principle. Okay. So you, t- you mentioned your mom and you said you, you think you're probably more like her. So who is she? Well, she's a teacher. She's uh, she was a teacher in my in my uh, kindergarten and first grades as well, of school um, and first classes. And um, it was um, I, I've got I've got so so on one side you we we had discipline from father, military discipline from father. Another side, educational part is from mother. She was she's very she's very uh, um, as well systematic in her own way. Um, and, um, and as a teacher, you know, she, she knows how to share the knowledge and how to, um, trigger kind of interest into the certain topics, if, even if you're not interested, but like you, you've got to observe some information. And, um, especially when back then in, in the years of being a teenager, um, you, you just, um, your focus is somewhere else, but not really with, uh, with education. So and she knew exactly how to guide and and um, trigger some trigger some interest to certain topics. Was she tough, or is she tough? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. She's, uh, you know, she was born in a very tough environment. Um, there's uh, um, there's land and uh, and place. It's called Siberia. The climate is very, very, very tough. Um, 
And um, so she was, she's from Siberia. She's, um, she's a tough lady. Uh, obviously, she's a lady. And usually we think about the, like the strong side is the, the male side and kind of more gentle is the female part. But she's um, as well pretty poor lady. She's, um, she knows what she wants. She knows how to get it. She's got endurance for sure. Um, systematic as well in a certain way, in her own way. And um, yeah, she's, uh, we, we've been lucky to have those uh, both parents because as I said, we're all reflecting more or less our parents. When was the first time that you were ever in a real fight? I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I was, I was 14. And uh, I lost two my fights, two my first fights I lost. And I lost two to my last fights. <laughs> I just realized after 27 years, uh, I lost, I lost my, my two last fights and I lost two my first fights. Um, you know, I, the first fight was against my roommate uh, back in the boarding school. And I kind of like, yeah. It was, it was like, it was my buddy, you know, we like, we played anyway, I lost. And the second fight was in circus. Think about it. You're 14, all that light. I was walking up the stairs into the ring. My legs were shaking. And then all of a sudden I have this, you know, gong and I have my opponent in front of me. And I like, punched him a couple of times. And then I stopped. I didn't know what to do. It was like total frustration. I didn't know how to finish him. I just didn't. And uh, so I lost. Obviously, the referee, due to my inactivity, said, stop. That's it. Um, you lost. The winner is your opponent. And the real fight was the third fight. And I remember it was, it was bloody. It was it was just a lot of exchange, direct exchange of punches, and uh, uh, I had a piece of pizza face uh, after the fight. <laughs> Literally, my face looked like pizza with salami, a lot of ketchup on it, and uh, and and I and I realized in that fight either I'm gonna be bitten or it's gonna be that way around. So there is no other exit <laughs> out of the ring. I chose me to be the dominant force. And with this fight and this fight, literally, or in, in the meaning of this word, I lick the blood, you know, and I, and I, uh, I won this fight, I won the third fight. And since, since that fight, actually everything uh, became, became more enjoyable, more fun, because I understood there is, there is no compromises because every compromise costs you time. And actually, every compromise takes you out of your goal, your focus. So if you take compromise that's actually happening in life as well as uh, in, in boxing ring, and it's just like you never stop until you finish. And um, that's where I learned in my actual fight, um, my third fight yeah, that I won, that changed changed my attitude in my life and in boxing ring as well as a fighter. I watched an interview where you said that um, you're cold-blooded in the ring, that you show no emotion. When did you learn to do that? As I just explained, it actually connects uh, uh, with each other. Um, you've got to be cold-blooded. Uh, cold-blooded, you know, with the meaning... You, you, you don't stop until it's finished. And uh, if you think about compromises, you're losing time and you're losing focus. So I can call it cold-blooded because um, I believe in life is pretty much the same. You have to have certain agility and you have to think multi-dimensional, not one-dimensional, but you have to adjust certain things. And I really love this theory Darwin's theory about survival, you know, not the strongest and not the smartest will survive, but someone who will adjust to the environment. So you need to certainly you need to adjust 
change is inevitable. It's always going to happen. And you just need to adjust to it. And even if I'm saying don't take compromises, it will cost you time and you're going to lose the focus for this time. Um, I probably, if you think multidimensionally, maybe you will make an exception at certain events in your life. But most importantly, you just, uh, you're the driving force. You just keep on punching, keep on going, and you never stop until it's done. When it's done, then you can look around and, and think, was it, <laughs> was it good or was it really good? <laughs> so I would probably describe it this way. When did you know that you were great at boxing? When I lost. Um, I, I lost two fights, two fights within 12 months. I lost as a champion. I lost my title, 2003. And um, I was uh, a year later, I supposed to get that title back. And if I was in um, Mandalay Bay in Vegas, and uh, I was um, ready to win, but I failed. So I lost and pretty much I was written off by all the experts, all of them during the broadcast. I started well, but um, I lost the fight. And all the experts um, were writing me off, including Roy Jones. Um, that was an HBO broadcast that I, that I was actually watching as uh, motivation for every other event after that. While they were talking um, about um, a fighter that has no chin and no stamina, they didn't know that they, they were talking about the most dominant um, heavyweight fighter um, of, um, well, do something good and talk about it in history. So um, 12 years, I think, combined, uh, there is no other fighter and so far in heavy division, which is probably going to change at some point. The records to be broken at some time. Um, but they didn't know back then that uh, they were writing off actually the most dominant force, force in, uh, in the division. And I loved it. So I, I, got, I, got, I got to understand that I'm going to be really good when actually I failed. I knew exactly and I start a new list. I changed my team, I changed everything. And believe it or not, my ally, my brother, even he said, you know, bro, I think it's just time to say goodbye to the sport. I knew inside of me, I knew this is not gonna happen. This is just the beginning. And, um, this gut feeling, it, it, it's not just something that you can read and learn. Either you feel it this way or you don't. And uh, that feeling was so strong, even though my cards were bad. Um, I just knew that I'm going to bounce back and um, I'm going to be the best ever. I cannot explain it how and why it just this, this certain um, gut feel that just gives you that all right there's a few things that i think are just crazy about what you just said the first is you had been olympic gold medalist 1996 you had already been heavyweight champion of the world by then by 2003 and you didn't know you were great already until you lost those fights no um and, and I'll tell you why I really didn't like what I, what I do, you know, I really didn't. I didn't like, I was not born as a fighter as my brother. I learned how to do it. And, and the reason was, I just want to get out of Soviet Union. I want to travel. And back then, you've got to be a politician to get over the border or an athlete. Otherwise, you had no chance to travel. 
as a regular citizen of Soviet Union, zero chance to travel. You can get out of the country. So, and I, for, the, for, for a politician, I was too young, but for an athlete, it was perfect. For an athlete, it was, it, it was my choice. And, but I chose it not because I love the sport. I chose it because I want to travel. That was a tool how to travel. And I still love it, you know, I'm, I'm, even though it's pandemic and the world, but, you know, still doing it, more or less. Hopefully safely. We'll continue to do that. And um, that, was, that was the initial, the initial idea. And I was, um, uh, uh, when I lost and I changed everything and I knew either I'm going to make it or not. And I knew I'm going to make it. And uh, I just um, fell in love. And Emmanuel Stewart, um, rest in peace, my Hall of Fame coach that I had worked with Thomas Hearns and Lennox Lewis and uh, Vander Holyfield and all the fighters and Oscar De La Hoya. So he has worked with a lot of champions and you've made a lot of champions. And um, there was luck that we actually found each other. And he picked me up from the floor, so to speak, after my two losses. And uh, even though um, no one believed uh, in me bouncing back, so, but he got that feeling and, and he did. So did I, and um, I shaped the team with him. And um, it, it, was, it was just um, through his introduction to the sport, like, like our mother, you know, she knew how to trigger the interest and Emmanuel knew how to trigger the interest for an athlete, for the sport. And, and I fell in love. As soon as I fell in love, there was not a, no, there was not a brainer that I'm going to make it. Because, and that's why I believe if you're obsessed, I know it's an extreme shape of love, obsession. Go for it. If you're obsessed about some goal and idea and like you never stop working. Because obsession has this, this drive. I know one more time, it's, it's pretty negatively based word, but uh, I, I, I love the obsession because if you're really obsessed about your goal, idea, you will reach it and nothing's gonna stop you. As soon as you're gonna fell in love with something and in an extreme shape of, of love, you'll manage to, to handle it and eventually you're gonna get it. What did that obsession look like, though, in real terms, on a day-to-day -day basis? After your two losses, you're shaking up your team, your own brother is telling you it's time to hang it up. What does that obsession look like? When you day and night can't stop thinking of it and about it, literally day and night, and uh, it gives you wings you have boost of energy, concentration. You have, you have an endurance that's uncomparable. Um, it just, and it's like a feeling, it's not you, it's something leads you, guides you. Um, as I said, with lots of boost of energy, that's how obsession looks like. It's 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 addictive, and um, as soon as you uh, felt obsession, you 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 kind of want to repeat it once again. It's uh, one more time. I'm I'm using words that are probably negatively based as uh, addiction, as uh, obsession, as um, there are plenty of of meanings of it and description of it that are probably not a positive because it's an extre extremism, extreme shape of, of all of those feelings. But um, if you use it for right reasons, um, you're gonna become unstoppable force, driving force. And how long and did you feel it. that obsession? How, how long did that, did that heightened state last? Until, until my last fight. So, Just think about it. How many people and how many people in different professions are changing their profession? 
So when there is next career, the next career, and next, and what's next? Second, third, fourth, fifth. Uh, and, and it's and it's amazing if you can do it. And uh, at some point, you cannot read fighter's heart or mind. Either you're a military man or woman, a fighter in a cage or in a boxing ring. Generally speaking, a fighter, it's very, it's, it's impossible to read fighter's mind and heart. At some point, we just, you, you're not losing a fighter, you're just changing the battlefield. And at some time, you change the battlefield. You choose another challenge. And, um, and you're looking at the odds and everything. And if, if you don't have fire in your heart or this obsession in your heart, um, it's time to stop. It's time to change the battlefield. And it's very difficult conversation with yourself, uh, especially when you were doing it for such a long time. And it's better to prepare yourself for the next career during your first career. So you plan it. And I was planning my next career for a long time. And even if, even if I was prepared, but it was very difficult to decide. And very important, if you make this decision, you better make it under your terms, not terms of other people, destiny, situation, anything else. If you do it under your terms, it's going to be difficult because there are options. But eventually, if you do it under your terms, you'll be so thankful. And only after time passed, you will think about it and you'll say, that was the right decision. It was under my terms and it pays off. So you had no regrets from when you left boxing in 2017? I have no regrets because I've been there, done that. Um, I was losing, I was winning, I was losing, I was winning, I was... Uh, trying all those different things and I've learned a lot for my my next career and um, and my life is boxing but boxing is not only my life thankfully so I can be busy with a lot, a lot of different things and there are challenges and the world is much bigger than the boxing ring and it's pretty much the same as an athlete you it doesn't matter a tennis player or a boxer or American football player so you're in your mind you're kind of in a box so you you think about your next workout your strategy your plan um how you're going to perform how you can make your performance better uh, and it's constant in your mind and you can travel you can see the world you can meet people you can do things but it's never going to leave you because you are in this kind of box and this um you kind of caged with your profession and then as soon as you step out you're realizing the world is bigger it's and 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 it's interesting and we have only one life and why not try other things out why not because it's under my terms i have no regrets um and i and i did the way i did it and i um and I'm happy about it because it was under my terms. And one more time, not because of my health. Managers, promoters, anyone else, it was my choice. And I've done it. And, um, you know, it, it some, it's, at some time, you need, to, you need to step down. At some time, you need to step down. Either you're a politician, you need to realize it's time to go. That's why we sometimes have dictatorships in this world because people just can't live it. And eventually it's going down the hill. It's going to bite you in the butt. So uh, there's, there's time, your time, and there's time to, to just step aside. We'll talk about some of the other things you're doing in the world, which is considerable. But I want to ask you a few other questions first about boxing. Um, were you the greatest of all time? Muhammad Ali, 
Muhammad Ali is the greatest of all time, and I had a chance to meet him in person many, many times and uh, chat with him. And um, uh, you know, to be great or be the greatest, it's not just to be great or good in your profession. It's also something that you could do aside from your profession. And Muhammad Ali was, uh, um, he was driving force for, for millions of people and evolution also in this country. And, um, you know, his statements, um, racial in this case and protection of the rights and, um, and the war in Vietnam back then. And so he was, uh, socially aware and he used his position in the ring aside uh, and outside of the ring and, um, and that's why I think that makes a person great I mean there, there, there are plenty of champions that retired and never lost a fight but we don't even know about them what makes you great and big when you're not just great in the ring but also outside of the ring in this case the ring meaning as a podcaster, a lawyer, like you name it, whatever profession you have, and um, something that you can build as a parallel and not just focusing on yourself, but also feeling that you are part of the society and um, make a change and be agile. And uh, if you can motivate people, not just motivate people, but also guide them in the right direction. That's what makes you great. And I think Muhammad Ali in this case um, is, 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 is just the greatest full time period. We can talk as much as we, as we can and as we want, but um, we're, actually, um, we're actually collecting the fruits and the seeds of it, he put it in the ground back then. So eventually we, we, we're getting into it. And he was, he was part of um, all this movement. And, and I think, I think he, he did, uh, it was very entertaining. And um, it, was, it was just enjoyable to, um, to observe him in the ring and outside of the ring as well. Your brother Vitaly, of course, also a champion boxer, considered one of the best of all time as well. But you never fought him. Professionally, anyway. Why not? Do you have a sibling? I do. A younger, older? Younger brother. Are you going to punch him in the face? <laughs> and, and, and Until someone is going to raise your hand. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> Silence? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You give me enough time with him. We might, I we hope might... your brother, I hope your brother is... is watching us and <laughs> listening <laughs> to us right now. Um, I know there are different relationships between the siblings. Um, my brother and I, we, yeah, we were raised um, more, more of uh, supporting each other. And, and actually, be, because we traveled a lot, um, he was my closest friend. Because you're getting in a new environment, you don't have other friends, so you, you're making friends later on, but then you're moving to the new place. And so basically, he was the closest, and I think the other way around as well. He was the closest friend that I can share things um, and do things and repeat and copy and, and show maybe some things that I can do it even better than him. And so it's, I think, kids, children needs children. So it, 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 it just... I think it makes um, it makes fun to learn from each other and uh, motivate each other. To just get um, over certain lines that are kind of scary to get over them and cross them. Um, I think uh, I think it's important. So I've got one daughter, so I wish I'm gonna have more kids than just one. You mentioned Muhammad Ali, and he became an icon during a very different era not only in the world, but also in media and in sports. So when he was coming along, there were only a few major networks, not hundreds of them. 
There was no social media. There was no internet. He could, he was the game in town on any typical Friday or Saturday night and millions and millions of people watched him. Um, your sport has evolved more into a pay-per-view style sport. What do you think about that? The model of boxing, the pay-per-view model. Is it good? Is it bad? I have a dream that boxing is going to be united under one roof as NHL, NFL, and many other sports where you have amateurs and professionals under one roof. When you have one system, educational system, system that takes care of your health, life insurance, health insurance, systematic, uh, to protect the core of the sport. And the core of the sport, athletes and fans. Not sanctioning bodies, IBF, IBO, WD, WD, so like you name it. Some, some of uh, people in the street don't even know all of the sanctioned bodies, the name of it and what does it mean, champion one um, federation or the other, people getting lost. Amateurs, professionals, you know, it's it, what's the rules, what's the difference? Um, experts know it, but like regular people, the majority doesn't. So I, I have a dream that the sport is going to be united under one roof where professionals and amateurs, not working against each other as it is and has been, but with each other. And you have pension plan as well as it is in other sports. And usually boxers are, um, you know, boxers perform and due to lack of the education, after their careers, most of them are broke because they don't know how to handle their finances or don't have pension or don't have health for it and don't have coverage for it. And it's good if you made uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, but even there is no guarantee that you're going to make it and not going to lose all of it. And there are plenty of examples. So, and I, and I just have this uh, wish and desire that uh, boxing is, is one of the oldest sports on this earth. And uh, probably one of them, and he just said it, um, back then millions of people around the world were watching Muhammad Ali and his era with George Foreman, not to disrespect other fighters. Because Ali wouldn't be Ali if they, he, he didn't have all of those opponents that made him <laughs> Ali. So, um, and I, I just, I just um, hope and wish and uh, will do anything in my power to, during my life, to actually secure the future of the young athletes. And so they can perform and um, can take care of their families and uh, everything is going to be taken care of them as well due to systematic uh, process and uh, monetization is going to be not a brainer. I mean, to monetize boxing is as simple as it is. And um, just think about it. Every week in this world, there is a boxing match. Every weekend or every week, um, amateurs or professionals could imagine what kind of content in the cloud that could be and how many fans even you're gonna reach if you if you just can have an application and and hey I want to watch that tournament and maybe follow that star they're gonna be a star but not yet or, or professional so you just uh, can explore yourself through one channel and application and and get it all monetization is gonna be so simple but we don't have it right now so we have we have interests of all different managers, promoters, sanctioning bodies, broadcasters that having an influence on certain fights will happen or will not. And, um, and with that, 
we're disrespecting the other side of the core, fans, because fans want to see something that they cannot get due to conflict of interest mentioned before. So anyway, and that's the dream and that's um, uh, be careful what you wish for is going to happen, hopefully, <laughs> eventually. So John Skipper, of one of the co-founders of DAZN, former top guy at ESPN, recently in an interview, he called for a playoff style boxing tournament, kind of like March Madness or something like that, where everybody's in one division under one brand and it's a it's a tournament style instead of just you know random fights happening and people fighting for belts here and there a tournament style what do you think about that idea well um i would say we can discuss about tournament style and how that is going to be. And uh, I, I would probably eliminate champions and all these different versions, as I said. Um, there should be, instead of decentralization, centralization, because it's so decentralized right now, it's chaos. <laughs> so I'm more in this case for centralization of the sport and um, Clearance. I'm not going to go through, uh, you know, tournament system and, and people that are listening to us right now uh, are probably going to get lost. What they want, they, they want to have another Muhammad Ali. There is Muhammad Ali back then and there's someone else. And of course, you, you know, Ken Norton and Foreman. And so obviously you get to know their all the opponents and um, some of them going to win or lose. Um, but um, I... I would probably focus on centralization and under decentralization, of course, obviously you're going to have different tournaments and um, you will get to see a new upcoming raising stars and, and, um, and respect all champions and uh, get content to watch uh, that as well. And I think it's all manageable. Um, if you put it in a methodical and systematic way, um, then, then it's going to work well. Speaking of, of uh, methodical, since we're, um, you have also in your background, a business school, okay? There's a line of business school. If you do things methodically and systematically, it's, it's gonna really help uh, people follow you and it's gonna help you to, to improve yourself and to get eventually a goal that you're, that you're following. Uh, and then I'm, and I, and I was thinking about the same way uh, after we were talking about Emmanuel Stewart, um, my former coach that actually passed away during my training camp. I was getting ready for a fight and he passed away. And um, as soon as that happened and I got a call from Marie, from his wife, the world stopped for some time for me. And I was thinking all this knowledge that this legend had is gone. Nothing got materialized in a way of methodology or system or a book. Nothing. Everything got lost. Everything is gone with the manual, except memories of probably guys as Lennox Lewis and and um, Evander Holyfield and Oscar De La Hoya that worked with him or myself, just in our memory. But how can we pass? how the young generation will eliminate the mistakes that were done. You can do it if you memorize it in different tools, as, as I said, systematic book or methodic, methodological book or, or, or methodology, whatever it is. And that actually triggered me to, to pass my knowledge. And, um, and I was thinking, how can I put it? And I, and I was talking to uh, my team and how can we put it all together and make out of everything what I've learned in boxing ring, as many other fighters, how can we drive it outside of the boxing ring? And eventually I got into this topic of methodology, which now uh, has a title, Face the Challenge, because we're all having different challenges in life not problems, 
I don't have problems and I, I wish you guys don't have problems, won't have problems, but only challenges because even though just the meaning of the word challenge is more fun. It's like back in the childhood. If you have a challenge, it's just uh, fun to solve it. And if you have a problem, it kind of freezes you. Just the wording of it, just the meaning of it. So face the challenge has four principles. Focus, agility, coordination, and endurance. F, A, C, E. Focus, agility, coordination, endurance. Those principles helped me to be as good as I was in the, in the ring of boxing, in the boxing ring, in the sport of boxing. And the same principles you need for whatever you do in the broadcast, as a politician, as a musician, as a golfer, it's pretty much the same principles, businessman or woman. And uh, this methodology has also philosophy and the philosophy called challenge management. And it's my own life philosophy, challenge management. And there is a, a study course, and this is sixth year at the university in St. Gallen in Switzerland, which runs in German language. And it's called challenge management, change and innovation management and self-management. And we're living in a world of a lot of changes. I just mentioned we can watch sunrise or sunset on Mars. <laughs> so changes are happening all the time and through the technology, it's, it just helps us to improve our lives. It makes our lives a little complicated, more complicated because we need to get along with the digital, digitalization and it's just, it's a process. And, um, and I was thinking about this methodology which actually was born and I'm, I'm happy and humbled to say that this methodology is now used on personal level through the study course um, already existing and it's the 60 year of this study course. It's a CES certified study course, as well as it was uh, presented in English at Harvard uh, three years ago. And uh, I'm happy that Harvard just announced two days ago, made a case study um, on the methodology and um, with my athletic background, which makes uh, me super happy um, to, to know that there is a case study. And uh, aside from personal level, as well as corporate level, such corporation as Deutsche Telekom, it's a, you know, in the US, one of the products, T-Mobile, so that's Deutsche Telekom. And um, SAP, another IT monster are using methodology in their ecosystem. SAP is matter of fact using design thinking. And we announced in Orlando that a um, couple of years ago, the synergy between design thinking and face the challenge method. And uh, whatever was learned in the boxing ring, through all the challenges and challenges that I had and uh, through this methodology, I'm really happy that this methodology has found its fans and, and it helps people to overcome their challenges and get a grip and uh, taking it more positively and and change the problems into challenges. So with that, I just want to say that if you do things uh, systematically and um, uh, with certain methods and you can use it, it's definitely going to improve and accelerate the evolutionary process in your life and life of the others in society as well and the world. Well, well, congrats. That's a huge achievement with the case study at Harvard and everything you've accomplished there. Your nickname, of course, is Dr. Steelhammer, and you've got a PhD. So you obviously care about higher education and believe in it. Why, why is that something a lot of boxers aren't really focusing on that? Why is that something that you have really honed in on in your life? If you're not educated, you're starting, and as I said, you're gonna make the same mistakes as generations before you did. Why? Why? Uh, just learn, 
analyze, adjust to your life, the learnings, and move on. And you're going to get better than generations before you did it. Knowledge is the key for, for an improvement in life. And it's, 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 it's just uh, human and not only nature. Evolution never stopped. We, we, we're in the process of it. So why should we not use the knowledge of the past generations? And, and uh, if it's there and present, you have to do it. That's like food for, for a hungry person. <laughs> Just use it to survive. So nowadays, I mean, you've got a lot going on. Obviously, you just outlined um, with your with your methodology and things you're doing uh, with uh, institutions of higher education. But you've got other companies as well. You've got Klitschko Ventures. You've got K2 Promotions. You have your own foundation. On any given day, how are you spending your time now post-boxing? I'm blessed. That's how I feel it. Lucky, really lucky to have allies that I have in my life. I cannot function without allies. I don't want to be a box promoter only. It's too boring for me, only. I want to have better orientation and I can have it if I'm exposed to different views and challenges. And my understanding of the world, because we all kind of, they're crossing of our paths. So it is important for the orientation and um, identify next challenges that you want to take, the more knowledge you have. I don't want to say I like, uh, I do everything. No, I don't. I have my own philosophy, what I don't do and what I do. And uh, I've decided as I said, not to be attached to one industry. I have different interests and that's what actually makes me happy. That uh, on one hand, even though I'm a boxing promoter with K2, but I'm not a boxing promoter because I have an ally, the CEO of the company, promotional company, K2. Uh, if it's a family office, then I have professionals that are good at finances and, and they've been spending their lifetime and still doing it. And so I'm getting, I'm getting from them the knowledge um, about my own finances and also finance of the others. So how can I do it as good as the others or even better? Now build, build tells. And I'm atelier, but not really, because I have a team that is with allies that are doing it. And I'm happy to give up um, the responsibility with consequences. Speaking of trust, so I trust you, you're going to do it. And I failed a couple of times, and it's okay. But it's not going to stop me to trust another person again. Because eventually I'm going to get what I want and in this process. You, you make mistakes, you fail. Uh, but after every failure, you like I'm getting like in the boxing ring, we talk about it. Now I know how, how it's going to work. As soon as I failed, <laughs> all of a sudden, you're just realizing now I know that I'm going to be successful. Because now I know the crucial mistake that I possibly will not do, <laughs> not possibly, will not do it again because I failed. And um, the variety of activities, political ventures, um, companies, and especially professionals, experts, and not to forget, there are not too many experts. And my formula is nine to 10, I mean, nine to 10 in percentage. So real experts are 10% or less. And trust me, 
they are also in boxing. And you know, as a matter of fact, my, my man in boxing and women. You have out of 10, nine fighters and one warrior. That warrior is an expert. <laughs> the rest are fighters. I mean, they would love to win, but if it doesn't work, okay, maybe next time. And the warrior never stops. He's eventually gonna get what he wants because he's a true warrior. And, um, and it applies, unfortunately, medical industry, doctors, only minor percentage are experts and the rest are doctors. Lawyers, if you think about it, it's pretty much in every industry, you've got this big amount of professionals and small amount of experts. And it's just, it's my formula 90, 10, more or less. And, um, and I was asking myself, Vlad, are you a charlatan or an expert? Because you're doing like so much. You can't be good at it. And I was a charlatan at some period of time and I didn't like it. So my answer is I'm not because I have allies. I have the team of experts. I cannot have knowledge in all of this, but I can put a team together or capable of, and I know how to shape it. And I love doing it. None of us is stronger than all of us. And that's how I take it. So I'm alone, not strong enough. But if I'm going with everyone else, then we're a strong force. What What do you want in life now? Be careful what you wish for is going to happen. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, Kids, more kids. I want to have more kids. I mean, as simple as it is. Um, on the professional side, I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward when the Howard case study is going to be taught. I want to be present. <laughs> you know, I, I used to dream about the school i'm sorry nothing personal and i understand you know <laughs> with the background <laughs> another university that but also part of it but you know it's all about it's all about um you need um, also your competitors or your allies it's called it's called competition anthony joshua the current world champion was my sparring partner back then and he was making me ready and get better for for my upcoming fights and that was competition. Eventually, we knew we we're going to meet in the ring. I think another thing I know, like we know, um, Larry Holmes and Muhammad Ali, they were also sparring partners before, and then we're ending up uh, fighting each other. But before that, there was competition. So Larry Holmes was helping Ali to get better for the next match. And um, all the ventures and uh, endeavors that I'm uh, gonna be involved in and uh, I just I just um, I'm just gonna keep on punching and um, as much as endurance, endurance as I've got I know eventually um, I will get a beautiful knockout I will knock out <laughs> something in a positive way and then conquer it um, even though I was well prepared for my next career I still have challenges not everything falls into my hands uh, and I'm okay with that and I will not even even and as I mentioned before even if I stopped I will keep on going I will not I will not stop because I'm in love with my goals that I have in life 
it's a nice Harvard shirt. That's awesome. But Coopetition, you can Google this, actually formulated by a University of Miami faculty member named Yadong Lu. Google that, Vlad. I, 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 you can look at that up. There you go. Yadong Lu, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using your practical theory. <laughs> so I really appreciate the time. We'll let you go in one second. You've, you've mentioned politics a few times. And obviously your brother is a politician and a very successful one at that. Do you have any interest in ever running for office or being involved in government? I'm an activist, always been. Sorry. I'm an activist and always been. And I think for right now, one politician in the family is enough. If things will change on your broadcast, I will announce it. Is that okay? Great. Well, we'll have you back then. Very good. Um, when you got, you were just recently uh, elected to the, uh, cla the Boxing Hall of Fame, 2021 class, the Boxing Hall of Fame. Where were you when you got that call? And what did you feel? Sounds pretty arrogant, probably. I didn't have a doubt that I'm going to get into, <laughs> into Hall of Fame. One more time, please excuse me. Well, you were first ballot. It was your, obviously, first, it was your first eligible obviously, year. Obviously, I was honored. But I'm not going to say I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honesty is, you know, sometimes not good. Um, so it, it, it was like obvious and logical and if i wouldn't really um be accepted into hall of fame i would have taken it okay like i my satisfaction is there i was in this sport for a long time in boxing and um and i had my ups and downs and if it's if it was recognized, I feel honored, and I have to say it also honestly. I feel honored, and it's um, Hall of Fame is a very special place. I was there once when my brother was inducted, and um, it's a home of champions. And um, as uh, Marvin Hagler said, that's the place where we feel home. And it was an interesting line, and I still remember this line, and uh, and. Uh, like to be part of that home is is an honor. Um, I I don't want to disrespect um, the choice uh, of the committee choosing me uh, by saying like, oh, I kind of was expecting that, you know. And then if you didn't get in there, like, oh, <laughs> your expectation <laughs> was was wrong. Obviously, I'm as I said, honored and humbled, and. Uh, and uh, I, I, I just also want that sport of boxing is going to be centralized, so that athletes, as Marvin Hungler and many others, won't say that Hall of Fame is the only place where it will where they feel home. Otherwise, if we feel lonely at the boxers, athletes, we feel lonely because we we feel left. As long as you can perform, you have managers, promoters, and everybody is like running after you. But then as soon as you're out of the loop, you're lost. You don't know what to do with your life. And that's the sad part. And I, and I want that um, Hall of Fame as a place, obviously, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a me mecca, so to speak. Yeah. Eventually, all the fighters that deserve to be there, uh, they're there, and entire city kind of stutter, entire city, um, like doing the job, police and medical department, everything, um, volunteer, the champions when they come, driving around in those cars and, and, and police and, and fire department take, takes care of people and putting it all in line and, and putting all in the system with discipline. 
and and it's amazing to see how entire cities light me up. And uh, one more time, I'm I'm honored uh, to be at Hall of Fame. Eventually, hopefully, um, now two classes are going. Three classes are going to be together because this year has been canceled with the pandemic. The event was canceled, postponed. I'm sorry, not canceled, postponed as uh, past year as well. And I hope that things kind of get better. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, yeah, honored and pleased, and I was expecting that. And um, and uh, um, yeah, couple last questions, and I know you got to run. The you've mentioned it a few times. To be a champion boxer, you have to be obsessed. I imagine you also have to be pretty confident, borderline arrogant, borderline full of yourself, I would think. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. But now in your current life in business, it's different. You still have to be obsessed, but how can you still be as confident? You have to rely on all these people. You have to work with the team. You can't be as confident in yourself because you're not the one controlling all the outcomes, right? So how is it different? How is it the same? Confidence comes with experience and with the time. There is also other confident person that never failed and it gives you confidence, but that person will fail uh, and confidence is going to be questioned. And the person is um, durable. The confidence will get even stronger and better after after the person gets them back on, on the feet. So confidence, you cannot buy in the shop as experience. You need to gain it through the years. Um, otherwise, I mean, as I said, there's sometimes confidence because the person didn't fail, doesn't know what it tastes like, doesn't know what it is. Um, and it's a blind confidence. So, Confidence gets only with experience. And I believe, speaking of my brother as a politician, he stepped in into the activity that has nothing with the previous career that he had. Politics, you know, boxing has rules. Politics um, has uh, very flexible rules. And uh, it's a very challenging field, very, of activity. But after now being, what is it, seven years as, as, as the mayor of, of the capital of Ukraine, I would say he's a confident politician because he got experience. He was not seven years ago at all. What do you think about your, your home country, uh, your native country? It's obviously gone through a lot of hard times, a lot of pressure from Russia in recent years. Um, what is your ambition and hope for the people of Ukraine? I'm more than positive that Ukraine is going to shine bright. I'm... I'm positive about it because just the background, we, we have uh, very, um, as, as Ukrainians, we have very talented people in our nation, just to name a few. Igor Sikorsky is Ukrainian and has started the first helicopter in Kyiv. So the, his, the first helicopter in his history was launched um, in Kiev. And the last one, by the way, uh, is going to be launched on Mars, as you've heard about it. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm sure you're probably using like lots of uh, people in this world. What's up? Jan Kum, Ukrainian, American Ukrainian. Um, the biggest cargo airplane 
and Antonov. The Ukrainian people sometimes forget about it and don't know maybe, but like we have a very talented nation and uh, with the airspace and satellites. And so we, we have this technical background strongly. And I think this, um, our nation um, is going to improve tremendously. We have challenges on the geopolitical side. And um, I'm more than sure that's gonna pass with, uh, with, the, with the politics. And as I said, everything needs, needs its time. And Ukraine has challenges due to, due to the war in the east of the country, the Russian-Ukraine war. Um, as soon as that's gonna pass, and only with help of allies, it, it possibly could happen. Al yeah. al alone, alone, we might go faster, but together we get further. My last question for you, and I really appreciate the time. Your country, a small, relatively smaller country as it's related to Russia, you as a boxer, not a natural boxer, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm stressing this too much, so tell me if this is a twisted... Uh, analysis, but in a lot of ways, you're emblematic of your country and you were so popular because you represented so many of these folks in these countries forgotten about or, or, or downtrodden by larger powers. How has your history as a fighter, as a boxer, as a tough guy, a real tough guy, how has that impacted your view of dictators and strong men around the world, whether it's Vladimir Putin or in other parts of the world? How has that impacted your view of it? I believe, I believe that, um, and that I'm not just alone. Uh, I'm lucky to go practically, not just the theory of it, but practically go through the Soviet system, understanding socialism, understanding capitalism and later on growing up in the west on one hand you can learn it in school through the books or watching documentaries but the other way is just like you just go through the system literally then this understanding gets in place and how you can possibly change or how how it could be and what you have and where the where the society can grow into and what's what's actually better and i believe that everything that is uh, forced to do eventually having an end as dictatorship the petters will fail. There is no doubt. And uh, I believe in this case, obviously, with certain system and methodology, and, uh, I also want to. I also want to. Um, I've been talking about personal level and corporate level, speaking of methodology, um, but governmental level would be great if. If government can, with the methodology, function, then everyone will understand their responsibility better, in my opinion. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, that some of the some of the co-workers of uh, the city council uh, went through the study course, and that improved. Um, improve their work and understanding. And as I said, I don't know, presidents or chancellors or prime ministers uh, govern uh, with methodology. That would be actually pretty good. Would have helped society better. So I've experienced, as I said, all those different systems 
I used to live and work in those different systems. And uh, I definitely understand that um, there's always going to be a consistent fight between the good and the evil. And you never stop. But you want to improve because good is more than evil. Evil is less, but you hear from the evil more because it just pops out through the uh, media events and everything that is happening. And we're just going to keep, you know, our endurance. We have to keep on punching and um, for democracy, for, for, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely um, for trans transparency. And in this case, um, speaking of uh, discrimination in any shape and form, That actually what makes us human to have different colors, nations, backgrounds. And discrimination has shown us terrible events as Holocaust, for instance. And if you're a creative person and not destructive, then you will make this world a better place. If you're destructive, you gotta be you're gonna be out of this world, meaning terrorism, destructive. If you create, you are you're the man. So I'm definitely on the side of uh, as a warrior, on the side of a of a creative. And uh, I'm against any disruptions in this case, or discrimination in any different shapes and forms of discrimination. So I'm against that. And the rest, evolution will take place. And as I said, dictators will fail. 